For over a decade, video game companies have created works of fiction housing some of the most memorable worlds and stories which have kept their fans entrenched in their franchises for years. For some, these journeys have gone on upwards of 15 years, and still the worlds continue to grow, forming a timeline of events which shape the universe around them. While some stories are much more apparent in taking the player on a journey they get to live through, for others, it requires a more watchful eye. A franchise that has managed to draw the attention of millions, while at the same time not having a playable story to experience the world many have fallen in love with. A gaming phenomena having built its story through shorts, comics, and small stories, giving rise to some of the most unique characters, is the world of Overwatch. Overwatch's story takes place not in a fictional realm or a mythical universe. Rather, its story takes place on Earth, in the not-too-distant future from our own. The world's advancements in engineering and space exploration would act as the catalyst for the events throughout the timeline. Luchang Interstellar, China's leading space exploration company, built and oversaw a research facility on the moon known as Horizon Lunar Colony. Various animal test subjects were sent up, where scientists studied and documented the effects of prolonged extraterrestrial habitation. One of the scientists deployed there, named Dr. Harold Winston, oversaw one of the primates, designated Specimen 28. The monkey displayed rapid brain development. Harold would teach the monkey science and inspire him with tales of human ingenuity. The gorilla passed his days, assisting Harold with his experiments and daydreaming about the Earth and the possibilities it holds. But while studying the effects of space served as a fascinating concept at the time, an engineering breakthrough would happen on Earth. This would come at the hands of the Omnica Corporation. They are the corporate company responsible for creating Omniums, massive self-improving automated robotics factories. These were meant to revolutionize robotic manufacturing, achieving economic equality. Because of their breakthrough, Omniums were installed on every continent around the world. Several creations would be made. A pivotal engineer and weapon designer named Torbjorn Lindholm would design some of this machinery, which would be used all around the world, such as the Titan, a giant mech designed to help with urban development. Other such creations included the likes of the Siege Automaton Bastion units. These were created by SST Laboratories and were designed for peacekeeping purposes. The OR series of Omnics were created as well in Nigeria and used as security bots. And of course, the most standard and civilian looking Omnic was created as well. Behind the creation of the Omnics was a woman by the name of Mina Liao. She was one of Omnica's best and most distinguished experts in the field of robotics and artificial intelligence. The creation of Omnics were meant to help with safety, health, transportation, and other such aspects for everyday life. However, as time passed on, what seemed like the beginning of an economic golden age for the world would only serve as the beginning of something much more disastrous. The Omniums began to break down. Independent analysis showed that the Omnica Corporation would never come close to their promises of growth and output. After being investigated, evidence of fraud was uncovered, and Omnica was forcibly dissolved. As for the Omnium factories themselves, they were all shut down. Years would pass, and no one thought twice of the Omnium factories. But a mysterious event would occur. Every closed Omnium all around the globe once again reactivated. Unbeknownst to anyone, they began building and constructing hostile military-grade Omnics where they were deployed without warning against the nations of the world. This would be the beginning of an event known as the Omnic Crisis. Russia was one of the first countries to be affected. Faced with new opposition, Russia was forced to develop new solutions for this new threat. Volskaya Industries was where they began manufacturing Sviatagors, large human-piloted mechs designed for combat, where they could protect the cities from the Omnic threat. All the other countries around the world were forced to adapt as well. The United States created the Soldier Enhancement Program, where they took ordinary troops and turned them into super soldiers. Two prominent members of this program were Jack Morrison and Gabriel Reyes. Meanwhile, in Germany, the J08 company produced the Crusader armor for their paramilitary organization. 
In Egypt, a team of highly skilled snipers were gathered to support its military. Ana Amari was hailed as one of the best and gained a reputation as the army's finest. And in South Korea, the government developed a mechanized armored drone unit called Mecha. While these new defenses and tactics of war sustained for a short time, the Omnic's self-improving software always allowed them to adapt and counter each of the individual defenses set up by each of the countries. As a last resort to the worldwide issue, the United Nations decided to form a small elite task force, filled with some of the most capable individuals from all around the globe. This task force would be known as Overwatch. The team consisted of Jack Morrison and Gabriel Reyes, the two enhanced soldiers from the US, Torbjorn Lindholm, the Swedish engineer who helped create some of the Omnics before the crisis, the expert sniper from Egypt, Anna Amari, and the leader of the German Crusaders, Baldrick von Alder. However, unfortunately, he would fall at the village of Eichenwald, choosing Reinhard Wilhelm to be his successor. Reinhardt, live with honor. His glory, old friend. Also recruited, Jack Morrison sought out help from the woman who created the Omnics themselves, Mina Liao. After the dissolving of the Omnica Corporation, Mina took the crisis that was happening heavily on her shoulders due to them being her creation. But instead of blaming the incident on her, Overwatch gave her an opportunity to join their organization and help put a stop to whatever was causing this mysterious crisis to which she agreed. This six-man squad, led by Gabriel Reyes, embarked on highly coordinated offensive attacks against the Omnics, targeting their command control protocols and seizing powerful AIs known as God Programs. The God Programs seized control of lesser Omnics in centuries and turned them to attack humanity. Through numerous missions, sacrifices, and acts of heroism, Overwatch was capable of rendering the armies inert and the Omnic Crisis eventually came to an end. The world once again had peace. But this war was not without its side effects. Reyes and Morrison, having been part of the same soldier enhancement program, had become close friends. But throughout the experience of Overwatch, while Reyes was in charge of the team, Morrison was recognized as the moral fabric, bringing out the best in the team members and helping mold their diverse agents into the elite task force they were known as. Because of this, the public often praised and recognized Morrison while ignoring the efforts of Reyes. After the Omnic Crisis ended, Morrison was promoted to Strike Commander, with Anna as his second in command. While Reyes became part of Black Watch, the newly formed covert operations arm of Overwatch. This team operated under the radar, not adhering to the rules Overwatch has to. All of the events post Omnic Crisis and before the time frame of modern day all happen within a span of about 25 years. While I am incapable of giving specific dates for each of these events that occur, as an official timeline has yet to exist from the writers themselves, just be aware that the time frame between some of these can vary drastically, between days, months, and even years. After the war, Overwatch experienced tremendous amounts of growth for the span of over a decade. They helped maintain peace, inspiring an era of exploration, innovation, and discovery. This era is referred to as the Golden Age. Elsewhere, a brilliant scientist and astrophysicist named Dr. Sibren de Kauper was considered a pioneer in his field. His life's work involved devising a way to harness the power of gravity. Equally known for his groundbreaking research and eccentric personality, he conducted most of his studies from his lab. Though the crisis was technically over, there still remained small pockets of Omnic resistance, and so missions were carried out to deal with these problems. One such mission Overwatch was sent on is known as Operation White Dome. A strike team under the command of Captain Amari, alongside Torbjorn, Reinhardt, and another private first class, the team would wind up getting ambushed, taking heavy fire from entrenched Omnics. While the battle inevitably saw all of the Omnics being subdued, both Reinhardt and Torbjorn were severely injured, Torbjorn having lost his arm and Reinhardt incurring heavy scars, saving his friend from the battle. 
having to be hospitalized for the time being, the young 14-year-old medical prodigy, Angela Ziegler, looked over Torbjorn as she had been a friend of the Lindholm family for some time. To keep his attention busy, mere months before Operation White Dome occurred, Torbjorn and his wife had a daughter. But because of his friend's injury, Reinhardt stayed by Torbjorn's side, but Torbjorn became so frustrated with his colleague that he made a deal with Reinhardt, that if he would leave him alone, he can name his daughter. It is here Brigitta received her name, and her godfather. She would spend her childhood in her father's workshop with an interest in mechanical engineering, listening to tales about heroes and chivalry from the legendary crusader himself. While the aftermath of the Omnic Crisis gave way to a whole new floodgate of innovation and exploration for humans, the war also had its effect for Omnics. The Shambhali were created as a response to the crisis. It was, as they referred to, a spiritual awakening. The Shambhali abandoned their pre-programmed lives to establish a communal monastery deep in the Himalayas known as Nepal. After many years of meditation on the nature of existence, they came to the belief that they were more than just artificial intelligence, and that, like humans, they possessed the essence of a soul. Recognizing the spiritual equality they held with humans, the monks, led by the Omnic known as Dakartha Mandata, sought to heal the wounds caused by the Omnic Crisis, and bring humans and robots back into societal harmony. Their message was embraced by millions around the world, and Omnic slowly became accepted in parts all around the globe. But while the Shambhali were focused on bringing humans and Omnics together, creating peace, a new terrorist organization known as Talon seeks to bring turmoil and conflict around the globe. It is their belief that humanity is strengthened through conflict, but their public face in the beginning was hidden well. They were known after the crisis as a well-paid mercenary group that took security missions that were sanctioned by official organizations or corporations. This made it easier for them to get new recruits who were ignorant to Talon's true nature. Though despite this, their organization is made up of a variety of individuals, each with their own goals and ideas. After the Omnic Crisis came to an end, Mina Liao still believed in the potential artificial intelligence held and how it could help humanity for the better. This led to the creation of the Echo Project. She sought to improve on the original Omnic's design. However, considering what Overwatch just managed to put an end to, and what was the result of Omnic's to begin with, the Echo Project, while greenlit, was severely limited. The United Nations did not want Echo to become another enemy of the government. So what Liao ended up doing was creating an adaptive robot that could be programmed to learn a multitude of different tasks. From medical support to construction to even technically a soldier. But once again, these were severely limited to ensure she hardly had any independent decision making. Instead, Liao had programmed Echo with an AI that learned through observation. By doing this, Echo was never fully complete. She was always learning, always observing. There was never something Echo wasn't adapting from. Echo was sent out on a few missions, but the higher-ups at Overwatch never fully gave her a chance, and so she was never put into full service. Because she wasn't sent out often to learn from the other agents, instead, after spending literally thousands of hours in Mina Liao's presence, Echo's behaviors, personality, and even speech patterns began to mimic Liao's own. Back on Horizon Lunar Colony, there was never any major problems through much of its time. Tests continued to be performed on the animals, and while Specimen 28 developed some unintended brain growth, he was not the only animal to develop side effects from its genetic therapy. A hamster by the name of Hammond exhibited exponential physical and brain growth as well. Like many of the other animals, Hammond's intelligence began to grow as time went on. He became more curious and much to the amusement of the scientists analyzing him, Hammond would frequently escape to various parts of the moon base, though always inevitably caught and returned to his cell. Unbeknownst to the scientists, Hammond was secretly teaching himself the skills of a mechanic, which would soon come in handy. You see, the gorillas on Horizon Lunar Colony slowly became so intelligent that they decided to turn on the scientists performing tests on them and start an uprising. They were capable of faking a critical airlock error, and when the scientists rushed to deal with it, they were jettisoned into the vacuum of space, and all eventually killed. All but one primate took part in this coup. Dr. Harold's monkey would go on to adopt the name of his caretaker, now going under the name of Winston. 
The monkey would then begin work on creating a rocket ship to escape the base and explore Earth as he had dreamed about for so long. Meanwhile in Australia, government officials gifted the Australian Omnium and the surrounding area to the Omnics that had nearly destroyed their country. This was done in hopes to establish a long-term peace accord. This arrangement did not sit well with a large number of the Outback's residents. A scattered collection of survivalists, solar farmers, and people who just wanted to be left alone formed the Australian Liberation Front and struck against the Omnium and its robot population in hopes to take back the lands that had been stolen. Events continued to escalate until the rebels sabotaged the Omnium's fusion core, resulting in an explosion that destroyed the facility, irradiated the region, and littered the outback with wreckage. Australia was now completely changed. The outback became unlivable to most, but there were some who survived, calling themselves the Junkers. They scavenged the husk of the Omnium and formed a lawless cutthroat society in its shadow, building Junkertown. This town is run by the Junker Queen, a charismatic and skilled fighter from the Scrapyard, a gladiatorial arena where human and mech battles take place. One of the town's Junkers, named Jameson Fox, also known as Junkrat, blabbed on and on about a treasure that he had found in the ruins of the Australian Omnium. The Junker Queen came to suspect that his claims might have some truth to them, and she sent some of her enforcers to wring the truth out of him. Desperate for defense, Junkrat offered a portion of the treasure to anyone willing to help. Another Junker named Roadhog, who had previously made an enemy of the Junker Queen, stepped in and saved Junkrat for a cut of the treasure. The two would team up, committing a string of crimes around the globe. Meanwhile, in a forest just outside of Eichenwald, a small bird by the name of Ganymede begins building its nest on top of the remains of a bastion unit. But it turns out this bastion is still alive. Ganymede accidentally reactivates it, now making this the last bastion unit. It admires the beauty of the world around it and bonds with Ganymede. Having forgotten its purpose, Bastion follows a map on its HUD. This leads to a meadow just outside of a city where it stumbles across one of its fallen units. Bastion attempts to repair the robot, but it instead accesses its memories. Suddenly, Bastion was reliving the war and saw its fellow Bastion units fighting German soldiers before being wiped out by Baldrick von Alder. With new clarity as to its purpose, Bastion reverted to its combat protocol and again marched towards the city with hostile intent. But Ganymede once again finds Bastion, offering a twig in friendship just as Bastion had done earlier. Bastion struggled with itself, deciding on whether to fulfill its protocol or accept a new life, where ultimately it became peaceful again. Bastion, having broke free from its protocol, began wandering the world with its friend. On the missions of Blackwatch, they took on the challenge of dismantling the Deadlock Gang at Route 66. Reyes led the operation and was inevitably successful in capturing several of the gang members. But one in particular caught the attention of Reyes, a gunslinger by the name of Jesse McCree. Impressed with his skills, Overwatch gave him an ultimatum, go to jail or join Blackwatch. McCree accepted the latter and served under the supervision of Reyes. It is under his time in Blackwatch, Jesse would frequently be ordered to guard and protect Dr. Liao and Echo, where he would come to learn the truth of Echo's capabilities and even forming a friendship with the two. Before the Omnic Crisis, Anna was a married woman. She and her husband Sam ended up having a daughter, which they named Furiha. Anna would have a good relationship with her daughter, teaching her martial arts and instilling her with a strong sense of justice. Furiha would spend a lot of her time in the company of Overwatch, hoping to one day follow in her mother's footsteps and join the organization. However, Anna, wanting a better life for her daughter, was against this. You grew up surrounded by heroes. They filled your head with stories of adventure and dreams of glory. And one day, you wanted to join them. But it was not the life I wanted for you. One mega corporation also affected by the Omnic Crisis was the Vishgar Corporation. They are a multinational corporate entity based in southern India who work in hard light technology. They were tasked with creating new, self sustaining cities to house the nation's displaced population. One such city, Utopia, was created using the hard light technology, which enabled its architects to shape the city's streets, utilities, and living spaces in the blink of an eye. One of their most prominent additions was a young girl named Satya Vaswani. 
after she was identified as one of the few capable of becoming a light-bending architect, Vaswani was plucked from extreme poverty and placed in the care of the Vishgar's Architect Academy, never to return home. Isolated and lonely in her new life, Vaswani immersed herself in her education and training. She quickly grasped the applications of the technology and was one of the top students in her class. Though she was one of Utopia's top architects, the Vishgar Corporation saw far greater potential in Vaswani's abilities. Giving her the moniker Symmetra, Vishgar sent her on clandestine meetings around the world to uphold its corporate interest and expand its influence into other countries. Vishgar also secured a contract to develop large tracts of Rio de Janeiro. Mexico also had its own problems and rising stars. After the Omnic Crisis, the Los Muertos Gang was formed. Though most consider it to be a lawless, opportunistic gang, its members style themselves as revolutionaries who represent those left behind by the Mexican government after the devastation of the Omnic Crisis. One of its members, Olivia Colomar, began performing hacks against said government on their behalf. Los Muertos believed that the rebuilding of Mexico had primarily benefited the rich and the influential, leaving behind those who were most in need of assistance. Commissioner Rivera was one such example. When Colomar brought him a basket of bread straight to his desk, she was capable of accessing his computer. She came to realize that knowledge was power, and so she kept hacking politicians, corporations, governments, and so on. The retrieval of information became an addiction, and her hacks became more audacious over time. Following her many conquests, Kalmar was supremely successful in her skills, but she was caught unprepared when she stumbled into the web of a global conspiracy, one that had also noticed her. With her security irreparably compromised, Kalmar was forced to delete all traces of her identity and went into hiding. Kalmar received a cybernetic graft and re-emerged as Sombra, determined to find out the truth behind the global conspiracy she had uncovered, to find out who really runs the world. Sombra launched an even more audacious string of attacks, initiating a worldwide hacking spree striking against governments, organizations, and corporations, such as Lumerico, an energy company based in Dorado, Mexico, as well as Volskaya Industries. Her exploits earned her no shortage of admirers, including Talon. She joined the organization's ranks and is believed to have contributed to its massive cyber attacks against corporations with strong ties to their governments. It is around some time in the Talon organization where she met and became close friends with a combat medic named Baptiste. The two had much in common. Both were amongst the thousands of children orphaned as a result of the Omnic Crisis. Dr. Angela Ziegler, while she had been a friend of Overwatch visiting on multiple occasions, she had spent her time attaining her MD and PhD. Over time, she rose to the head of surgery at a prominent hospital in Switzerland, and even pioneered a breakthrough in the field of applied nanobiology that radically improved the treatment of life-threatening illnesses and injuries. This, in combination with being a friend of the Lindholm family and having looked after Torbjorn after he lost his arm, she was offered a position in Overwatch as head of medical research, which she accepted. Meanwhile, in Japan, there was conflict within the Shimada clan, a criminal organization selling weapons, illegal substances, as well as assassinations. When their leader, Sojiro Shimada, died, his two sons, Hanzo and Genji Shimada, were left to inherit the clan. As the eldest Hanzo took head, and as advised by the elders, demanded Genji play a more prominent role than he previously had. Genji refused, and after being pushed by the elders, the brothers' disagreement turned violent. A fight had broken out between the two that, unbeknownst to Hanzo, ultimately left Genji gravely wounded, scarred, and on the verge of death, though Hanzo believed that he had killed his own brother. Genji was secretly rescued by Overwatch, where Angela, now going under the call sign Mercy, rescued him and nursed him back to health. The Overwatch scientists and doctors developed cutting-edge prosthetics that enhanced Genji's natural speed, agility, and overall reflexes. He was then recruited into the Black Watch division of Overwatch, where he would slowly begin dismantling the Shimada Empire. Hanzo, on the other hand, torn by believing he had killed his brother, began resenting his father's legacy and abandoned the clan. He would spend his time traveling the world, perfecting his skills, and attempting to restore his lost honor. He was then soon declared an enemy of the clan. Meanwhile, in space, Winston's rocket has finally been finished and he can make his escape to Earth. Hammond, on the other hand, decided to hitch a ride on Winston's rocket, building his own pod, which he took the liberty of attaching himself. 
The rocket worked and Winston eventually made it to Earth. While Hammond broke off and landed in Junkertown and began competing in the local arena mech battles. The details remain sparse, but Winston was eventually recruited and accepted into Overwatch as one of their scientists and soldiers. One of the biggest reasons why appears to have been because of a young pilot named Lena Oxton, call sign Tracer. She was accepted into Overwatch to test the Slipstream Jet, an experimental aircraft which was capable of teleporting. However, her first flight went catastrophically wrong. The teleportation matrix malfunctioned and both Lena and the jet disappeared. Months would pass, but it was later discovered that she had survived and had been broken off from the physical world, existing in a ghost-like state. She would disappear for varying amounts of time, hours, weeks, and even months. But thanks to the efforts of Winston, he developed and engineered a harness which used the teleportation matrix technology to her advantage. Lena was now capable of controlling her time leaps. It appears that this was one of Winston's biggest contributions before finally being accepted into Overwatch. Instead of being a pilot, Tracer went on to become a soldier for the organization. Also recruited into Blackwatch was a renowned geneticist named Moira Odiorain. She pushed the limits of genetic engineering research to the cellular level. Her practices and ethical standards were considered unsafe, and so her career and reputation was damaged. That was until Gabriel Reyes recruited her into Blackwatch, allowing her research to continue, where she experimented on Reyes, granting him the ability to disassemble and reassemble his molecules into a gaseous wraith-like state. On the ecological study side of Overwatch was Mei Ling Zhao. She was an innovative scientist whose technology was used around Asia for climate preservation. Because of this, she was sent to Echo Point, Antarctica, with various other scientists to study the severe weather anomalies in the region. However, during her time stationed there, the base was hit with an intense polar storm. The team weathered it out for as long as they possibly could, but as they slowly began running short on supplies, the team decided to cryogenically freeze themselves until the storm passed and Overwatch could send some support. This was expected to only last a few months. Another important character to the team of Overwatch is a man by the name of Gerard Lacroix. He was a key member of the Overwatch team. He was the man spearheading the operations against Talon, and because of that, he was a key target against the organization. One day, he, alongside Commander Reyes and McCree, were all at the Blackwatch headquarters in Rome, plotting how to take down one of Talon's leaders, Antonio Bartolotti an influential businessman who orchestrated many attacks on several Overwatch facilities. However, unbeknownst to the Blackwatch team, a Talon agent infiltrated the building, planting a bomb which was detonated just as Reyes and McCree were exiting the building. Many Blackwatch agents were killed, and Gerard was hospitalized. The Blackwatch team then decided to carry out a covert mission to kidnap Antonio to raise charges against him for his actions in Oslo. McCree, Moira, Genji, and Reyes would be the team sent out on this mission. However, realizing bringing Antonio in would surely do no good by the law, Reyes takes it upon himself to kill him then and there. An Overwatch facility was attacked. The team needed to respond, but officially, their hands were tied. Luckily, <laughs> Blackwatch plays by its own rules. We all knew who was responsible. Rumor had it he'd be well protected. Our mission was to drop in and get him out so he could face the music. At least, that's how it was supposed to go. Good evening, Commander Reyes. <laughs> how will this look on the news? Overwatch unlawfully abducting a respected businessman? Even if you take me now, my friends would have me released within the week. All these theatrics have been a waste of our time. You're right. Reyes, what did you do? This was not the plan! Well, looks like we're going with plan B.
this action would only serve as the beginning of the end. Target was dead. So, I guess he got what was coming to him. Still, it didn't seem right. But that wasn't the end of our problems. For the first time, people knew we were out there. New faces stepped up to fill the void in Talon. And I can't help but wonder if that's where it all started to go wrong. We followed the original plan and infiltrated the manor. From there, I evaluated the situation and made my decision. And I stand by it. When you're on operation, things don't always go according to plan. We were supposed to get in and out, unseen and undetected. Commander Reyes changed the plan. Survival became our primary concern. It felt like they had an entire army after us. The situation was highly dangerous, but the commander made the tough decisions, kept us on mission, and we got the job done. Everything was going according to plan. We were going to get in, grab the target, then get out. But then all hell breaks loose. It was like the whole damn city was trying to kill us. Blackwatch's existence was exposed to the public, and Antonio's death would only open more opportunities for others to take his place. These would include the likes of Akande Agundimu, a mercenary taken under and recruited into Talon by Akinjide Adiemi, the second Doomfist, though he was later betrayed by Akande, who took his gauntlet and the title of Doomfist. It is a title that is passed down between bearers. The first Doomfist was Adhabu Ngumi, known as the Savior. He was a hero of the Omnic Crisis before he eventually passed on the gauntlet. Also in the ranks of Talon is Maximilian. He served as Doomfist's accountant and was a key player in the organization. Talon then began to take more drastic measures. Gerard's wife, Amélie, was kidnapped and submitted to neural reconditioning and torture, turning her into a sleeper agent. Overwatch was inevitably capable of rescuing her, but unbeknownst to them, it was too late. Two weeks after her rescue, she killed her husband in his sleep and returned to Talon. She fully became emotionless and was trained in the covert arts. Losing her identity, she now went under the codename Widowmaker. Twenty years after the Omnic Crisis officially ended, there was still conflict between humans and Omnics. Steps were taken, and London's mayor Nanda planned a development known as the Turing Green SWO. This was meant to be a new home for the city's Omnics and represent the first step in improving human Omnic relations. Even Takartha Mandata and several other Shambhali monks attended this groundbreaking ceremony. But for some Omnics, it was far too late, and they decided to start an uprising at King's Row. After the Omnic Crisis, Omnic workers were responsible for rebuilding England. Yet, despite doing the work humans didn't want to do, these Omnics were not given equal rights and had been treated as second-class citizens ever since. Because of that, an extremist group made up of Omnics called the Null Sector led an uprising against the local government. London's mayor, Mandata, and hundreds of others were taken prisoner and held captive. This would last weeks, 27 days to be specific, until the British government forbade Overwatch's involvement in assisting with their problem. Despite this, McCree had already been dispatched to the area to scout the situation. By the 28th day, hundreds more were killed and thousands injured. Faced with uncertainty, Morrison sought the advice of his comrades. He didn't know whether or not to follow the moralistic code of what Overwatch represents, or obey the commands of his superiors. After exchanging words with the new trainee Tracer, who once again reminds him of what Overwatch stands for to the world, Morrison decided Overwatch's purpose was to help those that need it. And so he sent the strike team of Reinhardt, Mercy, Torbjorn, and Tracer for her first mission down to help. 20 years after we won the war against the Omnics, we were no closer to living together in peace. The building of a new home for the Omnics in London was supposed to be the first step in improving human-robot relations. But it never had a chance. The Omnic extremist group, Null Sector, launched a surprise attack on King's Row. Hundreds were killed, and thousands more were displaced as they took control. Now, they are hunting down the last of the survivors. It could be the beginning of a new war between humans and Omnics. Unless we can stop them, 
Commander Morrison has sent our strike team to liberate the city. It's my first mission, and the only way to save my home. I hope we're not too late. After making their way through hordes of Null Sector resistance, the team was capable of rescuing the hostages from the power plant. While the operation was successful, going against the Prime Minister's direct prohibit of the organization's involvement severely smeared the name of Overwatch. Because of the team's rebellious action, someone was forced to take the fall. Having been in charge of the strike team for King's Row, Reinhardt was forced by the organization to retire. Torbjorn was most upset over this, frequently talking to Brigitte about this betrayal. After the events of King's Row, Overwatch struggled to capture Doomfist, and so Sojourn, another member of Overwatch, suggested getting to Doomfist through his accountant, Maximilian. Commander Morrison, I have a proposal. We're going at catching Doomfist the wrong way. He's clean, but his accountant, Maximilian? Follow the money, and you'll find the dirt you need. I know you're worried about sending the strike team out again after what happened with Reinhardt but I've been working with them and I know they're ready. I'm putting Tracer in charge, with Mercy, Winston, and Genji in support. She's grown as a leader since the King's Row mission, and I know you'll agree. Call me back when you get this. And Commander, trust me, they'll get it done. Tracer by this point had begun showing great leadership since the uprising in London, so her, alongside Mercy, Genji, and Winston, were sent to capture him. to have guests. Hello, Jakes! <laughs> oh, he's getting away! This will get a lot harder if he reaches his safe house. Then let's make sure he doesn't. I'm on it. Remember, we need Maximilian alive. He's our only good lead on talent. <laughs> I'm not the one you should worry about. Don't get cocky. That storm is getting close, and Maximilian is as resourceful as they get. I trust you. Just try not to blow up anything else. Ha! No promises! While Maximilian almost managed to escape, he was apprehended by Overwatch. He immediately began to make a deal, ultimately agreeing to make an introduction with Doomfist. In somewhere, Max. Is this really necessary? Surely we can make some kind of deal. You are in no position to negotiate. You're coming with us. We know all about you and your associates. Oh, I have many associates. Perhaps it's not clear what I have to offer. My resources are quite substantial. Let me ask. 
What might you be in the market for? An introduction. Ah, and who is it you would like to meet? He told them that he would be in Singapore in three weeks' time. Yes. Yes, you would be interested in Doomfist, wouldn't you? You know what you're asking me is not simple and could cause many problems for me. However, I understand that if I do you this favor, perhaps you will do one for me too. I wouldn't have it said that I was being difficult during this interview, so... Doomfist will be in Singapore in three weeks' time. And I trust that you'll leave me out of any discussions you have with him. Hmm? It has been a pleasure doing business with you. It is here that Genji, Tracer, and Winston battle Doomfist. He proved to be more than an admirable foe, greatly injuring both Tracer and Genji. But thanks to a primal enraged Winston, he was capable of overpowering the Talon leader, ultimately leading to his capture and imprisonment. Amongst many of Overwatch's other missions included the takedown of the Shimada clan. Genji, ever since his initial recovery from his fight with his brother, has slowly been dismantling the criminal empire, a goal which ultimately succeeded. With the Shimada clan a shadow of its former self, Genji would leave Overwatch, going off to resolve his own inner conflict. He was repulsed by the mechanical parts of his body and could not come to grips with what he had become. He wandered the world in search of meaning, drifting for many years before crossing paths with Zenyatta, a former Shambhali monk in search of spiritual enlightenment. He believed the way to repair the problems between humans and Omnics was not through dogmatic teachings, but through interpersonal connection and engagement. Ultimately, Zenyatta followed his own path. He chose to leave the monastery and wander the world, helping those he meets to overcome their personal struggles and find inner peace. Though Genji initially rejected Zenyatta's wisdom, the benevolent Omnic would not be deterred. In time, Zenyatta became his mentor, and under the monk's tutelage, Genji reconciled his dual existence as both man and machine. He learned to accept that although he had a cyborg body, his human soul was intact, and he came to see his new form as a gift and a unique strength. Now, for the first time in his life, Genji was free. One of the biggest losses Overwatch faced came during an unexpected rescue mission. Ana Amari accompanied an Overwatch team led by Jack Morrison to rescue hostages from Talon. She was there to provide support from a distance with her rifle, but when her teammates began getting shot down by a Talon sniper, she created enough of a diversion for the rest of her team to get away, but after getting sights on her target, Ana shot the mask off of Widowmaker, revealing it to be Amelie Lecroix, who was presumed kidnapped. This hesitation over what to do gave Widowmaker enough time to shoot through Ana's sight and into her eye. She was left for dead, gravely wounded. The public, including Overwatch, believed Anna had died, but in reality, she had survived the shot and chose to let the world believe she was gone. The loss of Overwatch agents wouldn't stop there, as some members had left the organization and others perceived dead. One original member would meet her untimely demise. One day, Talon had launched an attack on an Overwatch facility Mina Liao was working at, and in the commotion, Dr. Liao was unfortunately killed. Everyone get back! Stay down! Stay down! With the researcher in charge of the Echo Project, KIA, the higher-ups in the organization were hesitant to continue pursuing this project. Because of this, all of the development for Echo was shut down. As for Echo herself, she was placed in quarantine. In the Dominican Republic, there was conflict between organizations. The Playa Cartel began encroaching in on Talon's territory. Because of this, Talon sent a strike team under the command of Captain Cuerva to seize the leader of the cartel, Daniel Fernandez. While the team were able to successfully locate Fernandez's hideout, Fernandez himself wasn't there. Cuerva then ordered the team to tear the town apart until they located the target. To that end, the Talon soldiers went from house to house, screaming for people to come out, only finding terrified civilians. 
Events escalated even further with the arrival of Italian aircraft that opened fire on the town, reducing it to burning rubble and inflicting numerous civilian casualties. While Medic Baptiste protested, Cuerva said that they had to set an example to the people if they refused to hand over Fernandez. As the carnage continued, the Talon soldiers started to loot the town. After coming face to face with a young girl who mirrored his own experiences in the Omnic Crisis, seeing him as nothing more than an unknown soldier who had destroyed her home, Baptiste lowered his rifle and fled into the night. He tried to escape in a fishing boat, but was confronted by Maga. He declared that Maga would either have to kill him or let him go. Over the radio, he heard Cuerva's voice asking if Maga had found Baptiste yet, but after a long pause, Maga said that he hadn't found him. He let Baptiste go, telling him to call him when he was ready to come home. Baptiste quietly thanked his friend and drove the boat off into the night. Disgusted with what he had done and determined to forge a new path for himself, Baptiste fled to Tortuga, Haiti. However, Talon refused to let him go. Baptiste knew too much, and so they sent operatives after him to silence him. Agent after agent came for him, including many of Baptiste's former comrades. Every unit that was sent to capture or kill him were killed themselves. To stay under the radar, Baptiste drifted from place to place, aiding in humanitarian efforts around the globe. Through these efforts, he came to meet Dr. Angela Ziegler in Venezuela. With Black Watch's existence now known to the public, Overwatch's reputation was tarnished. There was negligence resulting in high-profile mission failures, corruption and mismanagement, weapons proliferation, and human rights abuses. Because of this, the United Nations launched a lengthy and highly secretive investigation into these claims. But before anything could officially happen, Reyes, having finally been fed up with Morrison, chooses to betray him. At the Swiss headquarters, a battle between Morrison and Reyes would cause a large enough explosion completely destroying the Overwatch base. Neither Morrison or Reyes' bodies were found, leading to them being declared dead. A grave rests in Virginia, memorializing Morrison. With its headquarters and leadership gone, reputation amongst the public tarnished, and two of its founding members dead by the hands of each other, the United Nations officially disbanded Overwatch. The Petrus Act was enabled, barring the now former agents of Overwatch from ever continuing operations for it. Failure to comply was deemed illegal and punishable by prosecution. Private security then became more common. One, for example, is Helix Security International. They are funded by the United Nations in replacement of Overwatch. Very few people doubted disbanding Overwatch was the right call. After they separated, the world had never been more at peace. To many, Overwatch was the biggest threat to global stability and growth. And now that they were no longer active, things would get better. That idea would remain far from the truth. As for the now former agents of Overwatch, many of them became mercenaries. Mercy began traveling the world in her Valkyrie armor, healing the sick and wounded. Reinhardt once again decided to don his Crusader armor, and he, alongside Brigida, who asked to be his squire, fought for justice around Europe. Winston remained at Watchpoint Gibraltar, guarding the information of Overwatch with the help of his AI, Athena. McCree became a bounty hunter and vigilante. Torbjorn's work either went stolen or stashed away, and he worked to ensure it didn't fall into the wrong hands. Anna, despite her injury, began operating under the name Shrike, and became wanted in Egypt for espionage, assault, and theft crimes as she had been sabotaging Talon operations in Egypt. Also having survived a presumed death was Jack Morrison and Gabriel Reyes. Jack went under the new identity of Soldier 76. He would spend his time attempting to avenge Overwatch and figure out what really happened. Reyes, having joined Talon before Overwatch's fall, took up the position of leadership there under the name Reaper. Before the disbandment of Overwatch, Anna's daughter Fariha enlisted in the Egyptian army. Her tenacious persistence and tactical prowess caused her to rise up through the officer ranks. She was a courageous leader and earned the loyalty of all of those who served under her. With her exemplary record, Friha was well placed to join the ranks of Overwatch. But before she had that opportunity, it was disbanded. After leaving the army with a commendation for distinguished service, she was offered employment with Helix Security to defend the artificial intelligence research facility beneath the Giza Plateau. The top secret facility was touted as vital to the safety of not only the region, but countries across the globe. Fariha gladly accepted the choice assignment and received training in the Raptora Mark VI, 
an experimental combat suit designed for rapid mobility and devastating firepower. Under the callsign Farah, she worked to safeguard the AI installation. Though she mourned Overwatch's passing, she still dreamed of fighting the good fight and making a difference on a global scale. She was assigned to a strike team under the command of Captain Khalil with the rank of Lieutenant. Farah and her squad would be sent to a mission in Egypt where the Anubis God Program once again reactivated. It broke free of its containment and began turning lesser Omnics in the facility, breaching Helix's firewalls. Once the security was breached, it could become capable of corrupting infrastructure and launching military assaults. In response, Helix Security sent a team of engineers to regain control of the command center. After the team failed, Farah's squad was sent to deal with the AI. Upon entry, they found a wounded member of the engineers that had been sent ahead. Farah ordered that they move on, despite the protests of squad member Saleh that the engineer needed medical attention. Farah stated that the mission was more important than any of their lives given what was at stake. Disappointed, Khalil agreed, but pointed out to Farah that her squad was her family. The team then came under attack by more security bots, where in the ensuing fight, Khalil was killed. Per the chain of command, Farah took control of the squad. Further attacks caused another pillar to collapse, threatening to crush another squad member, Tariq, but thanks to Farah, she saved him, much to his confusion, as the mission always appeared to be more important to her. Her team then held the line while Tariq hacked the Anubis' systems, and the God program was inevitably shut down. As Tariq was loaded onto the squad's APC, he told her that she was his captain now, and that he would always follow her. Fariha reflected on her Ujjat, and that she'd misunderstood what her mother had told her all of those years ago. It did not mean she was protected, but rather she was the protector. She finally understood what it meant to be part of a team that stands for something. While the Vishgar company was tasked with developing large tracks of Rio de Janeiro, that promise never became a reality. Vishgar imposed controls on the residents in the name of building a more orderly society, enforcing curfews, cracking down on what the company perceived as lawless behavior, and exploiting the populace as a cheap labor force. Sonic technology was used to control the populace, however that technology was stolen by one of the citizens named Lucio Correa de Santos. With his stolen tech, he led a popular uprising, driving Vishgar out of the city. Lucio's leadership made him a star overnight and a symbol for positive social change, and his music skyrocketed in popularity. Whereas before he performed locally, he was now filling out arenas across the globe. He built up a career doing live shows and became something of a national icon in Brazil. With his newfound fame, Lucio realized that he had an opportunity to make a difference and change the world for the better. In South Korea, the Omnic threat never completely ceased. Every few years, the Omnic monstrosity would rise from the sea to assault South Korea and its neighbors. The Omnic learned from every encounter, as it had never been destroyed in any of its battles. It often reconfigured itself in a different form, appearing with new weapons and capabilities each and every time. As the Omnic continued to adapt, it eventually disrupted Mecha's drone control networks forcing the military to place pilots in the mechs. Scrambling to find suitable candidates, the government turned to the country's professional gamers. These individuals possessed the necessary reflexes and instincts to operate the mech's advanced weapon systems. Top stars were drafted, including the reigning world champion, Hana Song, also known as D.Va. Seeing her new mission as a game, D.Va fearlessly charges into battle alongside the rest of her mecha unit, ready to spring to her nation's defense at a moment's notice. Recently, she has begun to stream combat operations to her adoring fans, and her growing following has turned her into a global icon. While new heroes arose all over the globe, some villains were created as well. Decades of study and research led to Cowper to believe that gravity is a harness. Through his work, mankind would soon be able to command nature's most potent expression of gravity, a black hole. Believing he was close to achieving his goal, he performed his most important experiment on the International Space Station. However, something went terribly wrong. The field containing the experiment began to fail. As DeKalper desperately tried to figure out why it was happening and how to stop it, the brief formation of a black hole was triggered. Screaming, DeKalper was only exposed to its power for a moment, but he suffered serious psychological damage. The area around him began to experience strange fluctuations in gravity peaking and dropping in time with his reactions. Upon being evacuated back to Earth, DeKalper was quarantined in a secret government facility, 
between his ravings about the patterns of the universe, the psychic damage he sustained, the gravitic anomalies happening around him, and concerns for his mental well-being, he was deemed a danger to himself and others, and detained for years under the name Subject Sigma, with himself and his inexplicable abilities being researched. Isolated and unable to control his powers, de Kuyper retreated into his own mind, where he thought he would never see the outside world again. When Talon discovered de Kuyper's existence, they infiltrated the facility and broke him out, planning to use his brilliance and research to further their plans. In their custody, de Kuyper slowly gained control of his powers. Now, gravity moved according to his will, and he was closer than ever to achieving his life's goal. But the same experiment that had opened his mind had also fractured it, and he struggled to keep the pieces together. Sigma continued to develop his powers in hopes of unlocking the secrets of the universe, unaware that Talon was both using him and his research. He spent most of his time working off-site in a lab Talon had granted to him. Meanwhile, in a forest in northern Sweden, Bastion has been spotted by civilians as its travels have led it there. This causes panic amongst the residents, where they decide to hunt it down. Fully aware of what the units are capable of, Torbjorn, who happened to also be in the area, offers to deal with the Bastion unit himself. He and the town's leader go out to hunt together, but Torbjorn notices the unit's strange actions, how it's interacting with the wildlife, and the fact that the unit ran away after being provoked, which should be against its protocol. Torbjorn then confronts the robot up close this time, trying to get it to attack him, which the unit refuses. After once again being scared off by a small strike team, Torbjorn subdues them all and decides this Bastion unit is unlike any other. He then takes Bastion, and the two begin traveling together. Even though he remained in seclusion at the old Watchpoint Gibraltar and busied himself with new inventions, no former agent of Overwatch held on to the ideals of the organization more than Winston. He and his AI, Athena, continued monitoring the worsening state of the world. One day, Reaper and Talon agents decided to storm the base, attempting to gain the identities and whereabouts of the former Overwatch agents. Fortunately, Winston was capable of fighting them off for the time being, but this event was a wake-up call to him. The world needed Overwatch. Knowing full well the repercussions that could be incurred, he recorded a message and sent it to all the former agents of Overwatch. I made a chronal accelerator. I'm sure I can do this. <clears throat> to all agents of o to all agents of Overwatch. <clears throat> That's not right. To the former agents of Overwatch. This is Winston. <laughs> Obviously. <clears throat> 30 years ago, the Omnics declared war. The nations of the world had no answer until they called upon a small group of heroes. Overwatch was created to rescue humanity from the Omnic Crisis. We became the greatest champions of peace and progress mankind has ever seen. You were chosen because you had powers and abilities that made you... You joined because you... already know this. Look, the people decided they were better off without us. They even called us criminals. They tore our family apart. But look around! Someone has to do something! We have to do something! We can make a difference again. The world needs us now, more than ever. Are you with me? Tracer was quick to answer and rejoin Winston. Though only a few hours after her talk with Winston, she was present in King's Row to witness Takartha Mandata address a joint human crowd. While there, she came to suspect that there would be an assassination attempt, which would be correct, and she confronted Widowmaker amongst the rooftops. The two carried out a run-and-gun battle, but despite her efforts, Widowmaker successfully assassinated the Omnic. Enraged, Tracer tackled Widowmaker, demanding to know why she had done this. Chuckling, Widowmaker easily incapacitated her and departed in a Talon aircraft. This would be regarded by Widowmaker as one of her finest kills. 
Ah, the sight of one of my finest kills. That day, I felt alive. Having been part of Overwatch in the past, Gabriel Reyes also got the recall order. But since he's a leader in Talon, this forced him to move his plans much more quickly. One of them included the retrieval of the Doomfist gauntlet that was being displayed in a museum. But both Reaper and Widowmaker would face opposition from Tracer and Winston. With the help of some civilians, the two would thwart their plan, and Talon was forced to retreat. While the gauntlet failed to be taken, the individual is another story. In the early hours of the morning, a Talon aircraft entered the installation holding Doomfist, bypassing their defense systems without incident. Reaper emerged from the craft and broke into the facility, killing over a dozen guards in the process. Doomfist himself was able to punch his way out of his cell during the extraction. Helix lost track of Agundimu following his escape. Doomfist and Reaper then discussed recent incidents carried out by Talon. These include the failed assassination attempt on Katia Volskaya and the assassination of Mandata by Widowmaker. Doomfist then traveled to a casino in Monaco with Widowmaker and Sombra to meet with Maximilian. He reaffirmed his loyalty to Doomfist's cause by warning him of rivals within the organization who were unhappy with his return. There, he and Widowmaker were attacked by some of Talon's inner council members, Viali's men, though the pair defeated them easily. Doomfist, Reaper, Sombra, and Widowmaker then attended a masquerade ball in Italy. It was being used as a cover for a clandestine meeting of Talon's leadership. While his cohorts eliminated security and other targets, Doomfist confronted Viali on a bridge. Though Viali claimed that there was nothing personal behind his actions and that he was simply looking out for the well-being of the organization, Doomfist threw him from a bridge and to his death. He declared that Talon is not a group of criminals concerned with only profit. Doomfist and Reaper then entered a secret boardroom where they met with Maximilian and other members of the Inner Council to discuss his plans to start a new war. Having sent Talon on a course correction in his eyes, Doomfist began gathering people around him whom he could trust, people he could believe in. Sometime later, Doomfist traveled to Numbani to recover his gauntlet which was being transported to the city's heritage museum. He sought to spread discord between humans and Omnics. He began rallying his forces and Numbani's military was powerless to stop him. While there, he was confronted by a team of newly introduced OR-15 defense bots. Though Doomfist easily defeated them in the Numbani airport, reclaiming his gauntlet ready to take revenge on Overwatch. His action at the airport, however, did not go without causing a ripple effect. A young robotics genius by the name of Ify Oladel was supposed to go on a trip to celebrate her robotics grant, but the trip was canceled after Doomfist's attack on the airport. Having built robots her entire life, Ify felt the need to build something greater than the original bots, a true guardian of Numbani. And so she constructed Orisa, an upgraded and advanced OR-15 with the added touch of personality. Orisa was constructed from an OR-15 chassis bought from the civil government with most of Ify's grant money, and the allowance of her open-minded parents. Ify sought to create a robot that would act as the hero Numbani needed, and fulfill the well-meant intentions of the OR-15. While Orisa's relative inexperience can make her an occasional liability, Ify's optimism and willingness to make modifications to her adaptive artificial intelligence have always been able to set things right. While Orisa has much to learn about the world and its functionality, she stands ready to protect both Ify and Numbani with her growing sense of honor and duty. Sombra, still with Talon, worked with the Los Muertos again. She was able to hack the website of Lumerico, posting claims that its CEO, Guillermo Portero, was plundering the riches of Mexico to fill his own purse, that he had corrupted the government and would not stop until the entire country was under his control. These claims would turn out to be true. The emails also showed that Lumerico was in conversations with the Vishgar Corporation in regards to exporting its energy systems, a cause of concern given the company's actions in Rio de Janeiro. Law enforcement categorized Sombra's break-ins as a criminal action, and Atlas News reported on the Sombra Collective, mistaking Colomar's identity as a group. Sombra claimed that she was only acting in the public's interest. Her efforts incited a public revolution in Mexico against Lumerico, and pro-Sombra graffiti was reported all across the globe. Less than a week after the leak, Portero stepped down as CEO. By this point, Sombra was already hacking the network of her next target, Volskaya Industries. 
Sombra Reaper and Widowmaker would travel to Russia to assassinate the CEO, Katya Volskaya. Chase was given, and while it seemed Sombra was there to kill Katya, Sombra played a different game, revealing her intentions to be Katya's friend. For if she helped her out from time to time, she wouldn't leak evidence that Katya had been receiving technology from Omnics in order to help her country in their second Omnic crisis, as the Omnium in the region had reactivated. Sombra's motive for gaining Katya as an informant was to help her uncover the greater global conspiracy she had discovered. As her security was nearly through with getting the door open, Katya agreed to the terms, and Sombra teleported out of the office, reporting to her comrades that the operation had failed. The Talon operatives returned to the ship with only Sombra in good cheer. What seemed like a deal gone right for her, Katya summoned one of her best soldiers, Alexandra Zaryanova, and ordered her to find Sombra. Zarya searched for weeks all around the world until Katya sent her to Numbani to meet a hacker. Zarya was uncomfortable in Numbani, having fought Omnics for her entire life as enemies. The sight of humans and Omnics living together unsettled her and her mood wasn't improved when she discovered that the hacker contact was an Omnic named Link-17. Zarya was not happy having to work with an Omnic, but her duty made her tolerate it. Lynx showed Zarya the data they had gathered on the Sumber Collective, where Zarya explained that the supposed Collective was actually a single woman. And Lynx explained that given Sumber's calling card was a sugar skull, similar to that of Los Muertos, and having implicated Guillermo Portero for corruption, they headed to Dorado, Mexico, where they met with Portero himself. He wished them luck, but stated Lumerico couldn't give them any aid. Lynx and Zarya then went from door to door, asking hundreds of people to no avail. But they achieved a breakthrough at a bakery, where they met a girl named Alejandra. Playing on the girl's emotions, Zarya asked her if she had seen Sombra, and that if she had, she'd be a hero to her. The ploy worked, and Alejandra took them to the warehouse Sombra was operating from. Lynx deactivated the structure's security systems, and as they did so, they discussed Zarya's history and negative emotions towards Omnix. This didn't last long as Sombra revealed her presence. The two engaged in a battle of bullets and words, which ended as Zarya incapacitated Sombra with a graviton surge. Sombra demanded Zarya let her go, or otherwise the world would know Katya's secret. Sombra also went on to explain that she actually wanted Katya in power as a friend to help her peel back a global conspiracy. Zarya was skeptical, but her hand was forced as Link-17 collapsed and the warehouse would detonate in one minute's time. She decided to let Sombra go and rescue Lynx, escaping the blast with them. When asked why she rescued them, Zarya stated that she didn't know, and that a few days ago, she might have killed them herself. She stated that she would head back to Russia to continue to fight against the Siberian Omnics. After parting with Lynx, she conversed with Katya again. Zarya asked as to why she hadn't confessed where she got her technology from. But Katya explained that her secret dealings with the Omnics had to remain a secret for now. One day Russia would understand, but that day, wasn't here yet. Zarya agreed to keep her secret. Four years after the events of Monte Cristi, Baptiste visited a childhood friend named Ross in her clinic, helping out with the patients. The clinic was experiencing a shortage of drugs, as the pharmaceutical company they were getting their drugs from, Sinclair Pharmaceuticals, had kept raising their prices. On top of this already worrisome event, two of Baptiste's old Talon partners, Trung Lee Guyan and Maga, were in search of him for a job. Vernon St. Clair of St. Clair Pharmaceuticals owed money to Talon, and they wanted Baptiste's help with it. As incentive, Maga had revealed that he knew about Ross's clinic, and Baptiste knew that he couldn't take them both out in a fight, and so he agreed to the job. The following morning, the three men arrived at St. Clair's mansion, but when they arrived, they were confronted by the mansion's private security. A firefight ensued, and Baptiste made sure only to incapacitate the enemies, but his partners were far more brutal. They got the location of St. Clair from one of the guards and made their way through the rest of the mansion. After making their way to St. Clair's office, they found him holding a firearm, though he was quickly disarmed and asked why they shouldn't kill him right now. To bargain for his life, St. Clair revealed that days ago he had received a recall order from Winston, as St. Clair was a former Overwatch member. He explained that he had been a handler in Overwatch, but had fed information to Talon so that when the organization collapsed, he had been well paid for his services. That said, Guyan wasn't impressed. They already had access to this information, 
as ex-Overwatch agents such as Reaper and Moira were already part of Talon. Baptiste was instructed to end Sinclair's life as proof of loyalty. He instead dropped a flashbang and used his exo boots to propel himself and Sinclair through the office's skylight. As compensation for saving his life, Baptiste told Sinclair that he was going to provide his medical products for free, and that if he didn't do that, he'd let Talon know where he was. Sinclair, deep in shock, agreed to the terms. Baptiste then headed off to get a private vessel that he could escape in. However, Maga found him. Mimicking their confrontation from four years prior, it was a repeat of history that wasn't lost on Maga. He declared that he couldn't let Baptiste go this time. The two engaged in a gun battle, where Baptiste, through the use of his immortality field, was capable of detonating an object, exploding it. After the dust settled, there was no sign of Maga in the aftermath, but Baptiste believes he had survived. He then went on to text Ross of his deal with St. Clair, and to be careful as he feared Maga might be looking after her. As Baptiste made his escape on Sinclair's yacht, he scrolled through his data on Overwatch and discovered that Dr. Angela Ziegler was a member. He decided that if Talon was coming for her, she had a right to know. So to help track her down, he contacted an old friend of his, Sombra. Jack Morrison on his one-man army against Talon follows another lead to Cairo, suspecting he's found the location of a sniper called Shrike, who had a substantial bounty on their head. He assaults the compound of a known criminal and arms dealer named Hakim, who is offering the bounty as an attempt to draw out Shrike. Unexpectedly, Morrison encounters Reaper, who was there collecting information from Hakim about the Anubis' facility for Sombra's analysis. Reaper and Soldier fight, with Shrike appearing to assist Morrison, as well as revealing herself to be Anna. After fending off Reaper, Morrison admits that he can't actually fight this war alone, and he wants Anna's support. She agrees to do it on the condition that they dismantle Hakim's operation in Cairo first, which they do. Soldier and Anna then begin traveling together. But Anna wasn't the only former Overwatch agent in Cairo. Mercy, having abandoned that call sign, has been helping out in medical camps around Egypt for the better part of two years. After Anna and Morrison dismantled Hakim's operations, the two tracked down Mercy in her home, simply looking to be patched up. It is here the three discussed Winston's recall order, but Morrison was against it. He believed Winston needed it more than anyone else thinking that he never questioned why Overwatch fell apart in the first place, but he still believes Winston's heart is in the right place. The Three's reunion would be very short-lived, as a Talon team led by Reaper begins assaulting the Anubis facility. Morrison and Amari quickly head out to battle, as Mercy prepares to heal all of the injured. While Mercy doesn't like battle, she was forced into the thick of the action to help rescue two young civilians. Explosions caused Mercy to be grounded, where she was pinned down under the rubble of a collapsed building. Luckily, Morrison and Anna arrived to rescue the children, as well as her. Talon was eventually held off, and Dr. Ziegler continued the rest of her day treating patients. When asked what they would do next, Morrison told her that they were going to continue to follow Reyes, and that the trail led to somewhere in Europe. Anna left some parting words, telling her that once you're called a hero, it's hard to put down that mantle. And the two left. Anna's parting words resonated with Angela. She had believed her fight had ended in a failure, but thanks to her friend, she's realized there's still a fire in her that yearns for action and challenge. The want to help and do good, and so she once again bears her Valkyrie armor and sets out to rejoin Winston. In Echo Point, Antarctica, Winston's recall order reawakens May from her cryo sleep, only for her to realize she hasn't been gone for weeks, rather years. Nine years, to be specific. The rest of her research team unfortunately died to their chambers malfunctioning. May comes to see the news of Overwatch's disbandment, but still hopes to save the world with the data she's collected over the years. With the help of her companion Snowball, May is capable of getting a signal, which picks up Winston's message of recalling Overwatch. May then sets out on a journey to join Winston. Over time, she inevitably makes her way across the country and rejoins with Tracer and Winston. Reinhardt, having spent his time traveling and fighting with Brigida, had apparently agreed that they did not have to respond to Winston's recall. However, when they eventually returned to Eichenwald, where Reinhardt had initially learned of Overwatch years ago, he indicated that he was reconsidering his decision. Brigida was apprehensive at the idea, stating how they forced him out in the first place. But staring at Baldrick's acceptance medal, 
Reinhardt reflected on the events of his master's death. Visiting Baldrick's remains, Reinhardt placed the medal on the arm of his throne, returning it to the man who made him what he was. Echoing his master's words to him, he quietly declared to Brigida that he had been called, and that he would always answer. I have been called. I must answer. Always. On the 10-year anniversary of Genji's supposed death, Hanzo broke into the Shimada castle to memorialize his brother as he's done every year since. It is here the two brothers clashed once more. Wishing for death, Genji refused to grant it to him, instead telling him that he still had purpose and revealing his identity. Genji forgives his brother, saying that he must forgive himself now. The world was changing, and they would have to pick sides. The world is changing once again, Hanzo, and it's time to pick a side. Hanzo wasn't initially swayed, but Genji told him that he still had hope for his brother. And with that, he disappeared into the night. With the recall order obtained by Winston, McCree deep down thought something had to be done, but didn't think he was the person to do it. And so he sought out a friend from his past, Echo. Having been in quarantine since Dr. Liao's death, McCree had managed to learn that she was being transported by train as cargo, and the route just so happened to be headed through Route 66. Having anonymously tipped off his old gang members of a military freight train passing through with some valuable cargo, McCree relaxed at a nearby diner until his former gang made their move. It is here he was once again reunited and greeted by his past gang member, Ash, simply saying all he wanted was one of the crates. The plan goes south after refusing to tell her what it was, and McCree gets into a standoff. While outnumbered, he is capable of subduing his attackers, incapacitating all of them. With everyone subdued, he reawoke Echo and told her about how the world needs her. We're getting the band back together. They want me, but really, they need you. The two then part ways as he states he has some business to attend to. While Winston's recall definitely made waves in the world, the group couldn't sit around and wait for members' responses. The Null Sector once again re-emerged, but this time in Paris. And so the only current members of Overwatch consisting of Winston, Tracer, and May were en route to help out. It is here the events of Zero Hour take place. While many of the lesser Omnics were easily controlled, the arrival of a Titan proved to be more than a problem. Winston, Tracer, and May were all easily overpowered by the Behemoth, even leaving May greatly injured. Uncertain with what to do, Winston chose to draw the Titan's attention, while Tracer got May to safety. But luckily, the arrival of other Overwatch agents proved to be helpful. Genji, Reinhardt, Brigida, Echo, and Mercy all arrived to help put a stop to the Paris attack. With everyone's help and a little creative ingenuity, the Titan was destroyed, and the Null Sector on Paris was halted. With so many Overwatch agents reunited, this marked the rebirth and return of Overwatch. Monsieur, does this mean Overwatch is back? <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. And all that leads to the events of Overwatch 2. The organization, though a fraction of its former self, and defying the United Nations, is officially reformed. Past members still wander the world as vigilantes, and potential future members seek to do good for the world. So for now, that does it for the complete Overwatch timeline. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as more videos about Overwatch are soon to come out. Thank you for watching.